What's up, guys? I would be willing to bet that everyone here has heard of King Solomon. But I doubt that very many people have really listened to the story and heard what is actually going on there. Some of this stuff is mentioned briefly in the Bible, but the, all of the information I'm about to present is from outside sources from the Bible. It's in the Quran. Uh, Ethiopia knows the story, and Ethiopia is the only African country that was never colonized and has a really interesting history to it, too. And King Solomon is even talked about in Tibetan history. Now, we're talking thousands of miles away. This is a big deal back in the day, you know. But it was really hard to forget something like a king and his entire court flew into their mountains way over here. Now, we call it a magic carpet, but they had to have some way of describing it in a way that everybody understood and they said carpet, but uh, some of the counts say that it's made of wood. Some of them do say it was literally a carpet and it was made with a type of clay that was what they describe as magnetic. You know, it could be anti-gravity clay. <laughs> but they say King Solomon and his entire court, which is probably thousands of people, flew into Tibet. So is this a story of magic, which we'll talk about in a minute, or is it? ancient technology. And if you're new around here, I'm not necessarily talking extraterrestrial, I'm talking previous civilizations. The ancients to us had their stories of their ancients. So on top of that, King Solomon could communicate with animals. Uh, one example is when him and his court would be flying, he would have flocks of birds fly overhead to block out the sun so they'd be in the shade. I don't know what they did about the poop, but that's how the story goes. But yeah, he could communicate with animals, and that would be an incredible tool to have if you think about it. He also had what they call a shamir, and it. some legends say that it was a worm, and some say that it was a stone that could cut through other stone. It would eat through it, and they even kind of mention, in a way, no tool marks. And it gets even more interesting when they say it has to be stored in a lead box to not harm anyone. And also, when you read about the Ark, it could definitely be construed as a radioactive substance. He also had a magic ring that gave him control over demons or jinn. I'm going to call them jinn just because I think everybody's kind of got their preconceived notion with the other one. And Islam in the Quran has a different tradition about the jinn to where they were actually the creation before mankind. And the head jinn, Iblis, uh, felt superior to Adam, who was made of clay, because he, the jinn was made of a smokeless fire, and it was speciesist. <laughs> he said, no, I'm better than him, I won't bow down. And here's the deal, is all of the real ancient magic that you have heard of is the use of jinn. It's, it, from what I understand of things, I don't see any records of anybody that just had these magical powers. They used the jinn to do things. And I mean, they uh, not only with the story of King Solomon did the jinn go out and find deposits of copper and gold and all of this stuff, King Solomon's mines, but uh, also uh, up to just a few hundred years ago, they had state-sponsored official treasure hunters all throughout Europe that would perform these rituals to call on the jinn to locate ancient buried treasure. Because, you know, back in the day, if, if you knew you were going to get sacked, then you'd go stash your stuff out somewhere. You even see the checkerboard floor from masonry there. This is what all of that is about, Solomonic magic. It's the use of demons to accomplish your goals. Even the, the first temple, the first temple to God was built by demons. And Solomon, the great king, supposedly used demons. So uh, just think about how weird that is. What if I told you that the Pope from the 1600s called on demons to do his bidding? 
So the short list on Solomon is that he had a flying carpet. He could talk to animals. He had a worm that could eat through stone, which, by the way, he told an eagle to go pick it up for him. He had something or someone that was a metal detector that could tell him where precious metals were. And I just about forgot, uh, he had a teleporter because he teleported a whole throne room in the blink of an eye. So it's a crazy story. I mean, and, and are we talking some type of ancient tech or is it really that gen or that powerful? And that may sound a little ridiculous in our sophisticated technological world, but why do all of these higher ups do these weird ritual things that we keep seeing? Ridicule is a powerful tool to get someone to not talk about something. Anyway, popular topic on YouTube is how they how did they cut all the stones in these ancient megaliths? How many people had their money on radioactive worms? Because the King Solomon legend has what they call a shamir, and they say it's a little worm the size of a barley corn. It basically eats through the stone, and you got to keep it in a lead box. Now, by some accounts, they say it's a green stone. Some say it's a reptile, like here. Among the reptiles, the salamander and the shamir are the most marvelous. And this has nothing to do with the shamir, but the it's interesting what they say about the salamander. One who smears, smears himself with its blood is invulnerable, and the web woven by it is a talisman against fire. The people who lived at the deluge boasted that were a fire flood to come, they would protect themselves with the blood of the salamander. So we're talking about a little lizard thing here, right? <laughs> anyway... The Shamir was made at twilight on the sixth day of creation together with other extraordinary things. It is about as large as a barley corn, and it possesses the remarkable property of cutting the hardest of diamonds. So this thing is tiny. A barley corn is like a grain of wheat for us Americans. For this reason, it was used for the stones in the breastplate worn by the high priest. First, the names of the twelve tribes were traced with ink on the stones, and be set into the breastplate. Then the shamir was passed over the lines, and they thus were graven. The wonderful circumstance was that the friction wore no particles from the stones. What they're describing there is pretty cool. They're, they're putting some material on the stone that this shamir won't eat through, and they say they pass it over it, and it, it, doesn't, leave, it doesn't knock any material off. It's like it's just dissolving the stone. But, you know, in the world of physics, nothing just disappears. So there's something going on. The shamir was also used for hewing into shape the stones from which the temple was built because the law prohibited iron tools to be used for the work in the temple. The shamir may not be put in any iron vessel for safekeeping nor in any metal vessel because it would burst such a receptacle asunder. It is kept wrapped in a woolen cloth, and this, in turn, is placed in a lead basket filled with barley bran. They used barley for everything back in the day. It's the original packing peanuts, evidently. But, yeah, wrapped up and in a lead box specifically. Otherwise, it will burst such a receptacle asunder. <laughs> the shamir was guarded in paradise until Solomon needed it. He sent the eagle thither to fetch the worm. With the destruction of the temple, the Shamir vanished. So are they talking Garden of Eden paradise? Isn't that supposed to still be a physical place with a burning sword that turns every direction? Might be wrong about that. I've also heard it said that the Shamir lost its potency after the destruction of the first temple. And there's some other strange items like the Urim and Thummin, which were these stones that were put in the breastplate of the chief, and they were somehow able to divine the will of God. Also, if you look at the Ark or the whole story of Exodus, for that matter, you, you might think that you're dealing with some kind of atomic energy weapon, plutonium. Some have speculated it was a technological weapon. And when Moses asked God to show himself to him, he said, no, you'll die because of my glory. That's the word they use. My glory will is too much for you. So he has him hide behind a rock 
as he passes by, because that's all a human would be able to stand. And then Moses comes down from the mountain glowing and with horns, I believe. There's a lot of really weird stuff in there when you get into the tradition of what is in the Bible. But they don't talk much like it's a living thing because they pack it in leather and then barley bran, which is a dense, heavy packing material, and then a lead box. So if it was a living creature, I hope they treat their dogs better, huh, Ruckus? I haven't found any of the radioactive metals that we know of today that react with copper or steel that would cause the container to burst asunder or whatever they said. But I, I think there's some truth to these old legends and the way they say to put the ink on there and passed it over and it was engraven makes me think of some chemical compound that's activated by the shamir. So maybe for hewing the large stones, you draw a line down the middle and then activate it and boom, split. Anyway, I've heard a lot of speculation on how they used to cut stone on YouTube and I don't think I've heard anybody come up with little salamanders the size of a grain of Ooh. wheat. But there you have it. Uh, it. It does sound like probably a legend of some ancient technology that we're not understanding here. And it had to be picked up from paradise. So where's paradise? The North Pole? The inner earth? Now, the gin and all the other things that went on there, I'm probably going to have to do a video about that because that's a pretty interesting subject. And it's something that a lot of people still believe in today. We kind of mock and ridicule about it in our culture, but hey, the, the higher ups out there, they got some weird old school ritual and stuff that they do. So it might not be as far off base as you might think. Anyway, that's it. Static out.